Hello and welcome to The Hated and the Dead with Tom Lehman. This week, I bring you two episodes. This one, and another about former Peruvian President Alberto Fujimori. The Fujimori episode is a bit of an experiment, not due to format, which stays the same, but due to language. The episode is in Spanish rather than in English. To my listeners who can't speak Spanish, I offer my sincerest apologies. I was determined to upload the episode you're about to hear on the same day as the Fuhimori one, in order to give you an English language episode for the week ahead. To my bilingual listeners, you're very much in luck. You get to hear my tin pot Spanish through your headphones. Anyway, on with this episode. David Odson served as the Prime Minister of Iceland between 1991 and 2004. A libertarian in personal politics, Otzen took Iceland by storm in the 1990s by turning the ideologically nondescript ruling independence party into a party of low taxes and privatisation. Otzen projected himself as a sort of Margaret Thatcher of the near Arctic Circle. However, Otzen didn't only serve as Prime Minister. He also served as Mayor of Reykjavik, Governor of Iceland's Central Bank and as the editor of Iceland's biggest newspaper. Whilst he didn't serve in these positions at the same time, there was a clear attempt by Otzen, over a period of many decades, to get his friends and allies into positions of influence. He privatised the banks from Parliament, his friends took control of them, and he then let the banks do whatever they wanted as central banker. The issue is that letting the banks do quote-unquote whatever they wanted ended up nearly destroying Iceland's economy. In 2008, the country was engulfed in one of the worst financial crises in the world. Otzen's controversy therefore precedes him, and his claim to be a libertarian, somebody who wants the state to leave the market alone, looks completely false. Otzen was a crony capitalist through and through. My guest today is Icelandic investigative journalist Helgi Seljan. Helgi is an editor at independent media outlet Stundin and uncovered revelations surrounding the Panama Papers in 2016. As well as Otzen's career, we discuss the importance of fish to Iceland, Icelandic politics' ugly underbelly, and why Iceland has never joined the EU, and whether it should. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to introduce David Odson. Hi, Helgi. How are you? Hi, Tom. I'm great. Thank you. Good. It, Helgi, we're talking about David Odson today. I hope I haven't sort of massacred the uh, pronunciation of his name. Yeah, it was, uh, it was good. G- good. I right. worse. <laughs> <laughs> um, he was the Prime Minister of Iceland between 1991 and 2004. He held various other roles in Icelandic politics Mm -hmm. and in the establishment uh, before and after. Um, Odson, I've heard him describe his own politics as a libertarian. He was a group of people that sort of thought of themselves as libertarians in in Icelandic politics. Iceland obviously is a very isolated country. Libertarianism tends to do quite well in places that are quite cut off from the world, perhaps because, you know, in the wilderness there's a sense of, you know, individualism that takes hold of people. Um, what, how, how pervasive would you say libertarianism is within Iceland? Uh, I think actually it's uh, uh, funny that you mentioned it because I, th- I think it's, because I just had a talk with a friend about it recently and, and we were talking about how relatively open-minded Icelanders were towards the big changes that uh, David and, and his group of people that in a short span of years came to great power in, in Icelandic society, which they had and and have in a way still now uh, well, almost 35 years later. It's I think it's rooted in the uh, the written history and the history that we're taught about the Icelandic independence. Uh, I remember just a, a book that was part of the curriculum when I was a kid that 
was the story of, of part of, of the early history of Iceland. It was it just had the name the independence of Iceland, which was kind of funny because a lot of the time it spent we were not independent, uh, but we were you know uh, in a way waking up and 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 working towards independence. Uh, at around 1900, we were well we we finalized the independence in 1945, in 1944, but we were, you know, generally self-governed in 1918. But I think, you know, for people who were idealistic about being Icelandic and being free and being independent, I think libertarianism uh, was right up their alley. Olsen was born in 1948, and yeah. he became mayor of Reykjavik in 1982. Yeah. Um, I've been to Reykjavik, um, and in, in the most polite terms, when you're there, I, I felt anyway that it was like a very big village, almost. And I don't mean that it, in a sort of disparaging way, but it, it's, you know, it, it doesn't feel big for, like a, for a capital city, and obviously Iceland only has, I think, 300,000 a population of 300,000. Um, yeah. What's the politics of running somewhere like Reykjavik? Is it, does it, is it sort of parochial? What are the sort of issues that, pe- that are discussed in Reykjavik politics? Obviously, Reykjavik is so important uh, to the rest of Iceland in a way but, that few other capital cities are for their country. At the time that uh, David uh, became a member of the... Uh, of the city council and later was the mayor of Reykjavik, the, there was a totally different scenario. Uh, in these days, uh, those days, for example, the city, for example, had a huge stake in a fisheries, a big fisheries business, which was then uh, privatized under uh, when Dave, David was a mayor, which was one of the first of, of many privatizations that went through in what has been described as the big liberalization of of the Icelandic industry. So, in a way, times were different back then. But it was, of course, for decades, it was a huge stronghold for the Independence Party, the the city council and and the mayoral seat, of course, in, in Reykjavik. But that changed almost immediately after Otson left and became prime minister. And since then, I think the Independence Party has, I don't know if it's maybe one and a half term that they have been part of a coalition in the city council of Reykjavik. So, so yeah, at times they have changed because, and, and that has also been the case with the Independence Party nationwide. They have been losing the, the stronghold that they had you mentioned the Independence Party there a few times. Um, I mean, the Independence Party really is the uh, has been the sort of dominant political party in Iceland. I think they've only lost outright one election in two thousand and nine uh, for reasons that we'll probably get to. If you if you think about the in, the ideology of the Independence Party, um, what what do they believe in? What what type of independence? are they looking for? What are they emphasizing? Well, that's a good question because it was actually when Otson came to power, there had been some troubles in the party. It was split up and and he came to power at a moment when the party was repositioning itself through the ideology of, of him and, and the young libertarians. So, you know, of course, moving towards that, but I think if you look at what the Independence Party, the slogans that they use, for example, now, and they have been, of course, having troubles uh, ever since the collapse of the banks, although, uh, and, and for example, they, they've suffered bad re- election results over the past, uh, past elections. Uh, I think that that could be summed up to the word freedom and however you want to describe it that's the word that they frequently use and yeah they are of course a free market cutting red tape 
uh, party, at least that's how they want to uh, want their voters to look at them. But but they have been a ruling party for such such a long time that, of course, have been uh, called many names by their opposition by the opposition parties, and and they of course been been heavily criticised for for maybe to put it mildly distributing freedom a little bit unevenly. <laughs> we'll come on to that in a second. I mean, it, it, it might be interesting for people because the Nordic countries, I think most listeners would interpret as being broadly centre-left. Uh, the Independence Party is basically a right-wing uh, small state organisation. Yeah. That's quite an interesting contrast with, say, Denmark or Sweden, where the, the social democratic parties have, have sort of seem forever in power and, and very rarely leave power. What do you think it is about Iceland that, for that, that that's not been the case? I don't know. Like I told you before, I think it's, you know, a part of it is, it is probably cultural. And I think that, you know, it should be noted that the Independence Party, you know, from, from looking at the people that that uh, have been running for the independence party ever since I started following politics from, from the mid 80s or something, you have to see show that, that a lot of the people there uh, would wouldn't have to make a lot of change, even if they were running for a social democratic party in, in Scandinavia. But then again, you'd have people also that that you know would even find it hard running for the, the right-wing parties in Scandinavia. So it was, of course, a broad, broad group of people, but I think that's, yeah, it's not, not the same thing as it was in that sense. It's, it, it's moved right. Yeah. And obviously, Odson is is an important part of this. He became prime minister in 1991 after nearly a decade of being the mayor of Reykjavik. Um, obviously, this was very much a kind of you know this wasn't a change exactly in terms of the party anyway. He was just sort of taking over a mantle uh, from from people that had gone before him within the Independence Party. I'm intrigued. Just one more sort of question to set up a bit of context here. I mean, obviously, the, something that people will know about Iceland especially in, in Britain, is, is the so-called Cod Wars. Yeah. Um, as mayor of Reykjavik in the 1980s, would Odson have been particularly prominent in these kind of, you know, it wasn't obviously a real war, just, uh, but in terms, in terms of the discussions that were going on about the wars when he was mayor of Reykjavik? Well, the, uh, the wars were, of course, happened earlier. They were in the 70s, most of the heavy fighting uh, to put it like that but but <laughs> yeah i think i think that uh, you know and that was another thing that that icelanders had a, have had a sense of misrepresenting over the years that oversimplifying that that for example the cod war was basically where we brought you know the, the united kingdom to its knees we of course know that that now that the story is a lot more complicated, and it, of course, it, it involves the the U.S. and 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 basically our position in the North Atlantic, having a U.S. naval base, uh, which was always a lot of, especially people from the left, but also from the center, were were always skeptical on on, uh, on the U.S. Iceland connection and especially the naval base so it was basically the US had a lot to do with finally telling the 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 UK to to leave our waters so but you know we'd like to think that that it was just us and that sort of again about the culture of the Viking element of Icelanders and 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 yeah we us being few but incredibly strong and incredibly reliant and stuff so yeah, but to answer the question, of course, when David David became a prime minister, for example, and later on when he had a really good relations relations with, for example, 
Bill Clinton and George Bush, supposedly, something that I believe was a huge personal shock to him, at least it was to some of his most uh, dedicated followers, when the US suddenly announced in 2006 that they were going to withdraw the troops, so to say, and, and close down the naval base in Iceland. And I, for one, believe, and, and there has been a lot of talks about it, that, for example, Icelanders being part of the coalition of the willing, which was, in a way, a bit out of character uh, for, a, for a country that, you know, doesn't have an army, was, in a sense, something that Otson and, at the time, Foreign Minister Ausgrimsson decided to do just to see through it, see to it that the naval base wouldn't be closed. But that they didn't succeed with that, and in a way, that decision of, of taking part in the coalition of the willing marked, uh, in a way, an end to the political career of, of Ausgrimsson and badly hurt the one of Otson. If we look at Odson's premiership, it was 13 years long. Um, fish is obviously a very important industry for Iceland. Um, in terms of, you know, it, I think when we think of like national industries, the things that are really important to countries, they often, the government often wants to try and like keep them close. Mm -hmm. The state wants to try and be close to that industry. That's not really something that chimes with the views of a libertarian. A libertarian wants to kind of like, a, you know, roll back the state and kind of unleash the market on different industries. Um, how did Odson marry his kind of personal libertarian views on, on the economy with what I presume would be a view among Icelandics that this is almost like our, our flag carrier, really? Well... The thing about Otson is you have two sides of the same character. He was, of course, an avid supporter of libertarianism, privatization and this liberalization. But it became clear and clear and, and, and I would like to say crystal clear towards the end of his uh, seating at the, in the, as the prime minister and, of course, when he took over the central bank, that he wasn't all that keen on uh, letting go of the control of the state of, of, for example, who would be ruling the free market. And there were, there are of course many, many instances where he was, uh, for example, the privatization of the banks, and which of course is, uh, was a huge factor in the collapse of the banks some four years later, where Basically, uh, the owners of the bank were, the two banks were hand-picked, one by each party, setting aside all due diligence of, of the buyers and stuff, and, and in a way putting them into the hands of financial children, in a sense. So, well, it's, I mean, it's cronyism, really. Yeah, of course it is. And, and, and that's what, of course, I think will always be, that always taints the image of a lot of Icelanders about Mr. Otson, because, you know, as a libertarian, on paper, he, he of course, he ticked, he ticked all the boxes, he privati privatized, he, he opened the markets, he gave, made a deal with the EU and the European Free Trade Association, he was a part of that, you know, basically turning everything from black and white to HD in Iceland as his supporters would like to think, but only in a way that suited him and his cronies, in a sense. And, and he, he was, you know, and that's another side of him, the vindictive, not so keen on forgiving Otson, that, that of course was one of the big flaws, I would think, about, about the guy. When you think about his time in office, the kind of unleashing of the, the market and all of these things, we, 
in Britain obviously had a similar thing going on in the 1980s and 90s under Thatcher and, and also under Blair, the Labour Prime Minister who, who came after Thatcher. But I think there was a feeling, at least under Thatcher, that a lot of what she did, there was kind of like a base level of support for the kind of right-wing economics that she that she put on the country. Mm-hmm. Were, pe- were Icelandics crying out for this sort of thing? Or, or was this something that was very much just imposed by quite a well-organised clique who obviously had control of the party that had never been out of power, so it was hardly difficult for them to d- do a lot of this stuff? Well, obviously, you know... There was, at first, it wasn't done overnight. You know, there were, of course, they, he gained, you know, he had huge support, personal support, you know. We should not forget that for this guy, for him to be the one out of the the clique of young men who later became prominent members of government, industry and whatever, it's no coincidence that, that Otson became the most powerful and the prime minister. He was uh, and is a charismatic guy. Um, and people tend to forget that now when he's writing uh, op-eds as a, an editor of Morgenblad in support of Trump and you know, giving, giving wings to all kinds of conspiracy theories, you know, denying global warming and stuff. People forget that he was an extremely charismatic guy that Icelanders first recognized when he was a uh, when he had a famous radio show when he was in his uh, early twenties. Uh, he was really funny. He was and he was good with words, obviously. And he's a and he's a writer. For example, when he was prime minister, he he uh, he had a, a best-selling novel. I remember a short uh, book with short stories that he that came out and uh, also sold pretty well and was and, and and that's another side of him that 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 I think was also a part of how instrumental he came to be and and how powerful became, he became. But I think that you know although people know that he was a libertarian and he had you know these young guys. Were talking about free market and you know basically making their own kind of revolution. I don't think that 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 played a role early on when people voted for him, for example. But but of course you know when time went as time went by and and you know it was a prosperous time. People felt that in their wallet until of course we went bust, then there was no shortage of people who wanted to blame Otson for all of it and make him so, somewhat of a, a scapegoat for a, for a thing that actually a lot of people had, had trumped up in, in the years before. We'll come back to the sort of economic side of this. You, you mentioned the Americans, you mentioned three different presidents, you mentioned Clinton, Bush and uh, Trump. Uh, I think Odson basically had good things to say about all of them. I've seen videos of him meeting George Bush on his, I think, on his birthday, uh, Bush's birthday, and like giving him, a, you know, presenting him with like gifts and and all the, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, libertarianism is something that lots of people would associate with America. Do you think that politically he? He felt more comfortable in the States. I mean, obviously, Iceland is kind of straddled in between these two big continents. One, you know, Europe, people think of it as, as, as you know, being fairly liberal, fairly, especially on social issues, uh, fairly liberal, and America perhaps less so. Do you think he felt more at home, <laughs> westward, as it were? I'm not really sure. You, you, you know, uh, you have to remember that there wasn't a... Uh, there was no alpha male on the right uh, at the time that he was in power in the UK. They, they only had this, this light blue social democrat called Tony Blair. So it was, you know, <laughs> the parties were at least better when you were in the States. There were at least better photo ops with guys in power. But uh, it 
it should should also be recognized that you know he he became well uh, uh, it's fair to say friends with with people like uh, Silvio Berlusconi for example uh, and but but I think the issue of the naval base was always a a huge one and from around before 2000 it became at least a possibility that it hasn't been hadn't been for 50 years before that we might lose the base and just to put it in perspective you know it was uh, a huge uh, economical thing for Icelanders we, we had you know uh, big societies who were solely based on on, on a lot of work uh, were employed by the by the Navy and and so what? And and we had of course gained a lot of a lot of money from from the U.S. while they were here. Uh, so so yeah, I think that you know I think that's part of the part of the story why uh, he emphasized on on the photo ops in the White House and 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 the birthday present. <laughs> yeah, looking pretty ridiculous as has to be said. <laughs> he stopped being prime minister in two thousand and four. Yeah. Um, and and became the the central banker of of the, of the of the kind of of Iceland's central bank, the leader. Um, why did he make that shift? I think that you know he uh, you know the year the year or two leading up to him stepping down as prime minister and you know the year that he sat as foreign minister uh, i think there was there had been huge controversies uh, brewing for some time uh, related to his not so cold war with uh, the the Bauer conglomerate uh Bauer group who, who many of you your uk listeners might might know from temporarily buying up all kinds of companies in, in, in the UK. He was, well, Bauer, to explain, they had uh, they were a major player in the Icelandic retail business. They were the largest shareholder. And it was the, at a time when it was clo- called for a closer supervision of, of monopoly. There was, it had been clear for some time, all, all the way since Bauer went in, when the first bank was privatized, Bauer, with a young Jón Ásgeir Jónesson, kind of uh, outplayed David by putting together a group of investors that bought the bank from under his nose, a bank that David had actually planned to sell to <laughs> more favorable investors. So that kind of made him angry. Then there was this big investigation into Bauer that even though it wasn't successful at the end, and, and it's, it's a long story, but, but in a sense that it always reeked with political uh, interference. The fact that David's right-hand guy uh, was a minister of justice, you know, they were, yeah, it was a, it was a huge controversy, <clears throat> which ended kind of in, in Bauer being a, <clears throat> an owner of, huge media company in Iceland, the biggest newspaper at the time, the biggest or the, yeah, the, the only private TV company. And this was something that wasn't of, of Otson's interest. So the libertarian, one of his last fights as prime minister was trying to put in action regulations that would have basically cut Bogus media empire in half. That was a huge <coughs> uh, controversy, of course, and it ended up with the, the president of Iceland, who until that moment was, well, sort of like our elected royalty in a sense. Supposed to be above politics. Yeah, yeah, uh, but, but had through uh, articles of the constitution the power to take laws and put it into a national referendum. And for the first time in history, in the, in the history of the, 
of the Republic. This was done with the media law and Otson, of course, having had history with the then president of Iceland, was of course not really happy with that. And, and it was a fight that, that basically, as fights often do, made everyone dirty and him both dirty and I believe a little bit tired. So it was, of course, it was the, the height of, of, of the, his fight with, how, how, how would you say it, the, well, his version of the deplorables, which were the, the Böver guys and uh, the, part of the, the part of the free market that, that didn't belong to him. I mean, you've, you've mentioned, obviously, the, the disaster that, that came in 2007-8 as a result of, of some of this kind of trickery that, that Odson had put in place with the banks. Um, just for people who, I mean, I can just about remember this happening, but just for people who are perhaps younger than I am, um, can you tell? Can you describe to people what happened in two thousand seven, eight in in Iceland? I mean, it was pretty pretty dreadful. Yeah, we basically uh, we had a huge in a span of of a couple of years, our banks had grown exponentially. You know, uh, so when money dried up, foreign money, which had fueled the, uh, the banks that we now we know now were not the big foreign players that, as we thought they were. They were mainly piggy banks for their owners and uh, the relevant cliques. When the international crisis started, everything went bust in Iceland. We had, to, we had the three big banks, uh, who were like, uh, <clears throat> were, you know, a, a, a lot bigger economically at that time than, than I think it was 12 fold bigger than the national economy. They, they went bust, and Iceland, I, and Iceland and Icelanders almost went completely bust with it. Or we did, of course, but. Uh, we had to go to the IMF and, and endure a program of IMF, which was, you know, in hindsight, really good for us at the time. But, you know, it was a it was a huge, huge disaster, to put it mildly. Uh, and a shock to the system, yeah. presumably, after such a long period of, uh, uh, of, you know, stability and growth. I mean, uh, and I think this is the point, really along with, with his attempts to become editor of, of Iceland's main daily, this was the moment at which people really started to turn against him, wasn't it? Well, yeah. He was, uh, you know, uh, there was a one of the special investigation on the banking collapse and what, what went wrong. And, and uh, one of the things that came out of that was that Otson had in his job as central bank governor, you know, neglected to do his duty when, for example, uh, regarding the, the famous iSafe accounts and similar things and, and also by, you know, neglected other things that were believed to have helped in, in making things worse. So he was kind of forced out of the central bank and at time, you know, and these were, of course, crazy times. You even people even talked about it openly that they might have to carry him out of the central bank because he was not going to leave. But eventually, uh, in 2009, he was ousted from the bank and replaced. Uh, and a half a year later or something, he a group of companies that were in fact the the biggest. Uh, players in the Icelandic fishing industry who were really wealthy at the time and, and almost the <laughs> the only wealthy people in Iceland at the time uh, they uh, the so-called quota holders they bought Morgenblad uh, the mor mo morning paper as it can be called is, uh, had been uh, had just went bankrupt it had a uh, almost 100 
100 years history, it, it had always been, of course, right-leaning, uh, close ties to the Independence Party, but uh, still it was the most, the biggest newspaper in Iceland and highly regarded by many as being a, a good newspaper. But these guys came and they bought it from from insolvency and, and made David Otson the editor of Morgenblad. So we're talking about a guy who went from being a shark jock on the radio <laughs> uh, to being mayor, prime minister, governor of the central bank, to being the editor of, of the biggest newspaper. So, and as many people put it, uh, he wanted to end the career in, in you know, writing his own history. He didn't leave any jobs for anyone else, did he? No, uh, it's fair <laughs> to say that, you know, uh, that he didn't. He never was police commissioner, though. <laughs> I'm quite glad, considering some of the other things he did. I mean, yeah, but he definitely something... had hands in who was the police commissioner. And, and there's uh, and that's a, uh, another story. But, but that's one of the reasons that, that people tended not to uh, well, disliked some of his, uh, some of the ways and means he, he did his politics was, for example, uh, how he saw to it that his guy was named the police commissioner when, when it suited him, for example. Well, this is something I wanted to ask you. I mean, Iceland, when studies are released about international levels of, of you know, government, um, Iceland is often ranked in the sort of top 10 of like, you know, best governed countries. It's, it's considered, you know, a country a bit, you know, like other Nordic countries, you know, people govern with restraint. There's, you know, very high levels of freedom and freedom of information and, and, you know, separation of different powers. I mean, this completely blows that image that people have of Iceland apart. I mean, do you think that there is a sort of ugly, uh, underbelly yeah, of to your course politics. It is. Of course it is. You know, uh, just for me, for example, uh, when I have been meeting colleagues uh, and I have been working with colleagues from all over the world on big investigations, for example, uh, since before 2016, for example, on the Panama Papers and, and what transpired there was, of course, the fact that uh, a country of 300,000 people in the the Panama Papers dossiers itself, we had uh, 600 Icelandic names related to offshore companies, uh, which was, you know, per capita, we, we basically blew off every other country, which showed you, in a sense, uh, how big of a facade we put up for uh, foreigners and the ruling elite in Iceland has put up for for the general public, and a part of that is, of course, we were, you know, we were ranked as the the least corrupt country in Scandinavia, I think, at one point or something. One of the, uh, you know, best ranked European countries after the collapse of the banks and what transpired after that, the Panama Papers and stuff. We have, you know, we're we're at the bottom of the list of Nordic countries and. We have been, you know, falling on the list of uh, the free media. And I think the, the biggest uh, deficit uh, has been the deficit in the Icelandic ego. You know, we've had, you know, huge debts in this ego I told you about, about us being the conquerors and, you know, every Icelander counts as 10 or 20. Germans or US or whatever, uh, which of course laid ground for us believing that in a span of a couple of years we had basically decoded banking. You know, we, we actually believed that after a short period of us going from black and white to HD uh, in regards of the, the financial markets, we had basically been able to outsmart countries and cultures that had been ages and, and even thousands of years of, of dealing with, with money. 
So all of a sudden we had decoded the banking world, but then of course it became clear to us that we just created a, a Ponzi scheme. <laughs> I mean, what you're describing really is, is kind of a collective d delusion of, of grandeur, really, a, a kind of collective arrogance. Yeah. Um, I don't want to, you know, I don't know many Icelandics, so I don't want to pretend, to, you know, I don't want to say that you're all really arrogant. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, I, I come back to this issue of Iceland being very far away from everything and being very removed. You know, it's it's the you know, there's very little around around Iceland. Do you think that's where that kind of delusion, if you want to call it that, comes from? The, the, the fact that you're just so removed from everything. Yeah, and I, I, I it was best described by a by a guy who asked me a question uh, not so long ago, ago uh, when he asked me. Uh, Oh, so Icelanders believe that they are uh, wealthy because and not despite who they are, <laughs> which kind of put it in, puts it in perspective. We're here isolated, yes, but we have a, uh, we have huge wealth of national national resources. We have water, we have hot water, we have uh, geothermal and hydro energy, we have fish, probably one of the richest fishing grounds in the world, you know, uh, and due to our position, we are, you know, we are relatively few, peaceful, you know, all of that. And despite the group of people still living here, we are rich not because of it, as he put it. And I think, you know, being almost sarcastic, I think that's, you know, something that uh, that we should think about. I just have a couple more questions for you, Helgi, if you're happy just for, you know, 10 more minutes. Iceland's never joined the EU. It's always had a, a you know, a sort of close-ish relationship with the EU. It's in the European free trade area. Why? Why has it never joined? Fish. Thought so. Yeah, it's it's just a part of the uh, the reason that Otson was made the editor of Morgenblatt, and it, it wasn't even, you know, they they didn't shy away from from saying that it was the fact that the ruling government at the time, the social democratic leftist green government, was starting uh, to their talks with the EU, uh, formal membership for Iceland. And for the fishing industry, uh, which is the, the single biggest lobbying power in Iceland, that was a nightmare. And yeah, so the reason is fish. Do you think that, given what we were just talking about, and, and, and by the way, Sorry. you know, yeah. you could ask me like hundred questions about why Iceland this, why Iceland that, and I think at least two out of ten I could answer with the word fish. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, I mean, in terms of what we were discussing about, you know, a sense of isolation and perhaps a certain cultural complacency that comes with that isolation. I mean, obviously, the EU is, it, you know, is, is, has its own issues. It has many, many issues with with sort of corruption and financial trickery and all the rest of it. But do you think that possibly being in a club rather than just constantly talking to your own people and having to kind of cooperate with other countries in Europe, do you think that that might help to sort of move you past that? cultural complacency? Do you think that EU membership could actually do Iceland quite a lot of good from that point of view? Yeah, I think that, you know, uh, having told you about the, the overblown ego uh, that the typical Icelander, so to speak, has had and, and, and his own uh, misjudgment of his self-worth, uh, uh, 
I think that it's pretty hard to deny that we've always uh, done best when we've been in cooperation and the best connection with com uh, countries uh, abroad. And I think a lot of the reason that the people who have been pro-EU in Iceland uh, and, and, and of course we shouldn't forget that through the, uh, the FTA uh, agreement that we have, uh, we are, uh, you know, it's some, sometimes said that we are 85% members of the EU because we, uh, we generally uh, adapt, you know, uh, to, the, to the laws of the common market in almost every sense except for the, the uh, agriculture and fish and of course the monetary market but uh, and, and we've had since we joined the EFTA th there was a huge change in Iceland regarding laws and regulations and, and, and a lot of it what was deemed to have at the time to be, be part of a huge uh, liberalization of the markets and the free market was of course gained by the common law of, of the EU that we took in practice here. So, yeah, uh, and of course, just the mere fact that that having, you know, I, I wouldn't call it oversight, but to kind of like to get a th at least another eye or two on, on uh, for example, the government common laws and practices would be great i think that's what that's what people who, who tend to look to the eu are looking for they are looking for kind of <laughs> more separation of power between because we are at the end of the day only 300,000 we are basically coventry you know <laughs> it's a it, it's a hell of a lot nicer than coventry <laughs> <laughs> yeah at least we're not luton <laughs> Helgi, thank you very much. I really enjoyed that. Um, if, if people want to find out more about what you've written um, about Iceland, uh, and specifically, I know, I know you've written quite a lot about the Panama Papers, uh, where, can, where can they go? Well, uh, they can uh, probably go online, I think would be the best thing. Uh, try and I'm working at uh, Stuntin, S-T-U-N-D-I-N dot I-S right now. Uh, I used to work for the uh, for the, uh, the, the state broadcaster RUV. Uh, yeah, and, and yeah, you could you could find some of the some of the things I've done on, on online probably. Cheers, Hobie. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Hated and the Dead. If you've enjoyed this podcast, follow it on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, and for good measure leave us a review. You can also follow The Hated and the Dead on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook so you never miss new content.